I'd like to start the talk by figuring out who some of you are, because I don't always know like, what the makeup of the people in the room are. So we're, we're just going to go one by one, and everyone's going to introduce them. <laughs> um, so can you stick your hands in the air? Do you identify primarily as a DevRel person? OK. Uh, an engineer? And an, another assorted business person? Of, oh, wow, lots, lots of business in the house. That's good. That's good. And anyone else want to just randomly shout out a thing that you consider yourself that I've not put in one of the buckets already? Infrastructure. infrastructure. Great. Thank you for infrastructuring us all. Uh, yeah, so I'm trying to make this talk like a wee bit of a kind of whistle-stop tour of just some stuff that I feel like I've found useful over the years with uh, my forays into open source land. And I'm going to try and do a little bit of hand raising on occasion to see what you're thinking. And if you ever just want to stick up your hand just for no apparent reason, then do that as well. I've also got, <laughs> well done. Someone's listening. Great. One person at least. Um, so at the bottom of the slides as well, I have like a little link shortener situation going on. And I've got, I try to like link to as much stuff as possible. If anything I say is interesting and you actually want to read more about that, but if you don't, please don't. Saves bandwidth for everyone. So, right, me. I'm Mike McQuaid. Uh, I'm. I, I still kind of identify as an engineer. Technically, I guess I'm like a co-founder of a business situation right now. We'll talk more about that later. I'm based in Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, my open source main kind of thing for the last while has been Homebrew. I've been maintaining that. Thank you. I've been maintaining that since 2009, uh, and I'm now the like, project leader, which means I stand for election every year. No one else has ever run. Please, <laughs> someone in this room, run and <laughs> set me free. <laughs> so we've uh, worked with maintainers and contributors all over the world over this kind of 15-year period, mostly over text, sometimes occasional video calls, and occasionally in person. We've started meeting at FOSDA in the last few years as well as a group, which is quite nice. I was also a principal engineer at GitHub for 10 years, wasn't principal engineer for all that time, but hey, resume padding's okay. Uh, I worked from my home in Edinburgh, uh, mostly working for teams on the west coast of the US, which taught me lots about that you don't tend to learn in the UK, such as talking about your feelings and avoiding conflict. <laughs> I'm now the CTO of a startup called Workbrew, which, as you might guess from the slightly convoluted name, is somewhat adjacent to Homebrew. We're trying to do stuff around like Com big companies who want things from Homebrew that Homebrew volunteers don't want to do, we're going to try and commercialize some stuff around that. I'll talk more about that a little bit later with two ex GitHub people who are on the east coast of the US. So my talk is going to be based on three Bs. The first B I'm going to talk about is boundaries. So is anyone able to spot what this lovely bit of text is from? Anyone want to raise their hand and shout out if you're that much of a licensed geek? No shame here. It's all good. This is the... Yes, MIT license. Congratulations, you win nothing. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but uh, my summary of what this part of the license at least says is, and don't worry about reading all my license summary, uh, essentially, the software you get is the software you get. If it's buggy, that's your problem. Tough luck. The maintainers don't promise you that the software has ever, does, or will ever work for any user or use case even the ones that we say that they do. <laughs> Maintainers are never responsible for any problems that anyone experiences, even if they cause them deliberately by themselves because they think it will be funny. And if you disagree with any of this, you're not allowed to use the software. So I wrote a, a little post about this a while ago called Open Source Maintainers Are You Nothing, um, which a lot of people who are maintainers or open source adjacent really like the title, and everyone else hated the title. Um, and I, you can see some good discussion of that. If, and I'm not actually even joking here. If you Google for Mike McQuaid asshole, there's <laughs> a variety of people who think that this is not the correct way to approach open source. Um, but to me, like this is, I mentioned boundaries before. Like there's a lot of talk about kind of burnout. I'll kind of mention that later. But like a lot of people ask me, like, how have you been able to do this for 15 years without uh, going any more mad than I already am? And for me, it's, it's boundaries, right? Like, I don't do things I don't want to do, and I think it's a really important thing for anyone in open source to internalize that unless you're getting paid to do it, and then even then, that doesn't necessarily always apply. If someone is rude, if someone is mean, you don't have to do what they say. I will close issues that are legitimate problems because the person who has opened them is just being nasty. 
Um, and people don't like this, but that's how me and other people in Homebrew are able to actually stay involved for a decent amount of time. Does anyone know who this lovely lady is? Brene Brown. Yes, some enthusiasm in the room. Good, good. If anyone who hasn't discovered her, uh, she's social worker, researcher, author, podcaster, talks a lot about like, just generally how to be a better human. Um, and one of her like, courses she does, um, she talks about this kind of braving acronym for like, the seven elements of trust. So the ones that jumped out to me were when I kind of were listening to this and kind of thinking about how this might apply to my job and open source and stuff like that, or like boundaries, reliability, and integrity. Because if you want to trust people, you cannot be someone who is untrustworthy. And if you want to be trusted, you need to be trusted by others as well. So for me, it, the way I kind of think about this, because I'm primarily an engineer, is by turning all human problems into computer programs. So I think about, like, instead of you know, how I might deal with computers and how I might deal with humans being separate, like, let's try and conflate the two a little bit. So bad APIs are APIs with inconsistent and unpredictable behavior. So if you go and repeatedly ask for the same stuff and you get radically different results back, that generally sucks. If you are documented that you do one thing and you do something completely different, that generally sucks. And an API that every time you call it, it will try and do some overly complex query and then time out generally sucks as well. And a lot of this applies, in my experience, to human relationships as well. So humans who are more consistent and predictable in their responses are more pleasant to deal with. If you are someone who, at work, when your coworkers ask you to do something, if it's your big, big, big boss, you say it will be done in a day, and if it's the person on your team you don't really like, you say it will take a month, that's not a great API. If you say to your coworkers or people on your open source project that I am on holiday, I am not to be disturbed for the next week, and then you are on Slack or email every five minutes answering questions because you feel like you're too important to actually go on holiday and let other people do their job, that's not a great API. So to me, your boundaries are what your API are, and that helps you figure out how you should be treating others and how others should be treating you, and that consistency makes it easier for people to understand you and generally probably makes it easier for your life as well. A nice experience I had in the past at GitHub is I had a manager who, rather worryingly for me at least, start my performance review with, Mike is very strict with his boundaries. And I thought, oh no, I'm going to get criticized for the fact that like, I insist on having dinner with my kids like most nights of the week. But he went on to say that this made it easier to work with me because he knew when he could ask me to do things and when he couldn't. And it modeled that behavior for kind of new parents in the team that it's okay to do these things. So I would encourage you as well, those of you who might kind of feel that it's overly indulgent to exercise your boundaries around these things, that you're not just doing it for yourself, but you're also doing it to help kind of model those around you, particularly if you're in a position of more experience or authority or power or whatever, you can enable it for other people to do those things. So I think, like, I don't want to get too deep on this, but I think one of the key things with setting boundaries is how comfortable you are about saying no to things. Like, I talk about... Um, front-loading disappointment quite often, which is a lot of the times, if you're someone who is very willing and able to say no to things sooner rather than later, you're making that person maybe disappointed straight away instead of being disappointed in three months when you're not able to deliver or do whatever they thought you were going to do. So if you want to read more about that, there's a little link down there. And more specifically to open source, there was a big movement a few years ago about trying to make things really, really easy for first-time contributors to projects. And I think that's really valuable from the perspective of like documentation and teaching resources and smoothing like onboarding flows and stuff like that. What I don't think scales very well is like hand-holding first-time contributors through how they get involved with a project. Um, because if someone doesn't know how to use Git, for example, and you're having to teach them every command and your project has like tens of thousands of contributors, you're probably not going to be able to do that for tens of thousands of people. But when people kind of express interest and they kind of come back again and again, then that's often like a nice time to maybe get a little bit more involved and help them out. So the next B is burnout. So as I mentioned before, I'm someone who's been lucky enough to not really have ever felt burned out with open source. I've definitely had periods of uh, temporary large amounts of irritation, um, as I'm sure many people who work with me have has, as well. But I've managed to sort of stay involved. And for me, what that's looked like is over the years kind of prioritizing my own kind of mental and physical health and like, as I mentioned before, boundaries and stuff like that. Something I found very helpful personally um, is seeing a therapist 
like I started seeing one during COVID, um, and it has really helped me to uh, figure out kind of how to manage this stuff. We probably have a lot more ex sessions than my therapist expected, talking about like a particular pull request on homebrew and someone who <laughs> is trying really hard to be nice and helpful, but are not doing that and actually being deeply unpleasant to a lot of people and how I handle this and all these types of things. So if it's something that you've considered and not tried, I would encourage you to. I've written a little kind of step-by-step -step guide if you're like, how do I even go about finding one? That might be useful to you. Another thing I found really helpful with kind of avoiding preventing burnout in myself and others is kind of having like decent relationships like inside, outside work. But in work or in open source land, I try and have something that looks a little bit like this. I guess I call it like the mentorship diamond. So it's this idea that um, I used to be religious. I kind of stole it from religion originally. Like, I can't remember what it was. It's something like, I can't remember any of the words anymore. But anyway, I stole this idea. It's not mine. Um, but this idea that essentially, for anyone, it's a good thing to have people above you, people beside you, and people kind of below you who you can speak to. So if you're in an employment situation, like your mentor might look like someone who has the job that you would like to have in five or 10 years. And your peers would be someone who has like maybe a similar job or someone in your team or whatever, and your mentee could be anyone. The nice thing about this is I do say, like, unless you're literally the most experienced person at literally everything in our entire industry, then you can always find a mentor. And similarly, like, unless you are literally, if you, unless you were born during this talk, you can probably find a mentee who you have more experience than them and you can help them with some stuff. And I just, I also think the other thing, those of us who have kind of jobs in more kind of formal corporate environments, often like an org chart looks quite a lot like it's structured like this. So you might think, oh, this comes for me automatically. But I think this is something that's really worth like putting a little bit of effort into to actually like find these people yourself and not essentially rely on like, well, my manager can be my mentor and my mentees can be the people who report to me or whatever, because it just makes it a little bit more fluid and you can help find things a little bit more easily that way. Another thing I guess I've thought about with kind of avoiding burnout with open source is trying to find people who will replace me. Um, who's, I don't know if any people have done any sales stuff. Have people familiar with sales funnels? Yeah, like a few people. So I guess the idea is basically that you generally get lots of people at the top of the sales funnel, uh, like potential leads who have no interest in you or what you're doing, but you haven't figured that out yet. Um, so you send them all uh, about a million emails and then some tiny proportion of them reply with something other than go away, leave me alone. And those might call prospects because they've shown like some sort of interest and then some tiny proportion of them may actually end up paying you money one day. And those people are sales. So in open source, I think we have somewhat a similar thing um, that I call like the contributor funnel, which is like generally most projects will have lots more users than they have contributors and lots more contributors than they have maintainers. Last time I crunched the numbers on this for Homebrew, um, the numbers are roughly like we have roughly 30 million Homebrew users, we reckon, from like analytics data. We've got like 12,000 contributors total in the last 15 years, and we've got about 30 current Homebrew maintainers and about 50 lifetime, which is apparently 0.0015%. So when you're being yourself up, your project that kind of is used by a few hundred or a thousand people doesn't have like most of those people wanting to help you contribute or maintain or whatever, like cut yourself a little bit more slack. But at the same time, do bear in mind that like, you know, if you can, the more you can grow this funnel and the more easy you can make it for a user to contribute or contribute or to kind of come and join you as a maintainer, that may well end up taking some load off you as well. Right, so the last thing I'm gonna talk about is business. And don't worry, as despite the emoji, like I'm not a very suit and tie, businessy, businessy person. But I guess like it was a third B and money in open source feels like a kind of relevant thing for us to be kind of talking about nowadays. So Homebrew's kind of had an interesting like money journey basically. So when I joined, it was very much like Homebrew didn't have any money. It didn't need any money. It was just a random project on GitHub. People submitted PRs. This was in the days before ubiquitous CI. When we start with Homebrew, it didn't have any CI at all. It was all just verified on someone's machine. Um, and the first thing we kind of did when we sort of realized like, hey, we maybe need some money here. Uh, we figured we kind of could benefit from having some Macs, which would like automatically kind of run some CI on pull requests on GitHub. So, because it was 2013, the way you went and asked for money on the internet was a Kickstarter, we raised a 14,859 pounds. Um, and that was then used to kind of buy some hardware, which was like physically 
taken on a train by me and installed in a data center and all that good stuff. 2016, we joined the Software Freedom Conservancy, which provides like fiscal hosting for us. Does anyone, anyone familiar with what fiscal hosting means? So, yeah, so essentially it's like providing a, a bank account and like legal services and someone who can like hold trademarks or anything like that for your open source projects. So that made us, well, it made us a part of a 501c3, like a US non-profit essentially, so we could go and like receive tax deductible donations in the US and all this type of stuff and give us a bank account. So then after that, we kind of had somewhere to put our money, we had somewhere to receive new donations and somewhere to, like a process for like paying out and stuff like that. 2017, we started using a Patreon to kind of try and get some more monthly donations and stuck that in our readme. 2018, uh, we started asking for donations on Twitter. But 2019 was the, the big kind of exciting time when we made um, Homebrew itself, like when you first installed it or if you had, had it already installed, you would see a one-time nag message that says essentially Homebrew is run entirely by volunteers, mostly in their spare time. Please consider donating. And then 2021, we added Open Collective. Uh, see if you can spot when we added the, the message to our... <laughs> Yeah, so almost immediately our kind of incoming money went up by a lot. Um, so, and no one has really complained about the message. You get some people get kind of a little bit suspicious or paranoid about asking for money as an open source project, but I would strongly encourage you, if you're an open source project and you need the money, then do consider like having a one-time nag or whatever. And I also think I have found that people are a lot more responsive to that often than kind of like advertising and things like that. Another thing to think about with open source is, like, again, I've heard a lot of people talking about open source economics in the last few years. So I kind of wrote a blog post about this and sort of spoke to my father-in-law, who's a professor of economics, um, who just, because he's a very clever man, just says it depends a lot, um, about, like, okay, help me understand, like, what is economics? How does it define it? Blah, 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 blah. So, like, he, he sort of said, like, well, you know, we're mainly capitalist economies here, so it's the allocation of capital and how that throws through businesses and stuff like that. Um, and, then, and then I kind of thought, well, whenever I see people talking about open source economics, they're all talking about money and, like, how open source projects get money and spend money and stuff like that. So is that what it's about? Um, well, like, if, every, if you make everything about money, um, and I guess, you know, no shade on our lovely American friends in the room, but I often find when I talk to kind of American folks about open source and European folks about open source, often I find like that sometimes on the American side there can be more of a focus on like we need to get money, money will solve all the problems, the lack of money is all the problems, more than I do over here. Um, but like the idea that kind of money fixes all the problems, it's like homebrew is kind of in an interesting phase right now because we have quite a lot of money in the bank. Um, you can go in our open collective and see that we have, you know, six figures of funding, which is like both far too much money to spend on stickers and also, <laughs> unless you get really good stickers, like if anyone knows the best stickers, then let me know. Um, but also like not enough to like sustainably actually pay like people to work full time on homebrew. So in our case, we have quite a lot of money and that doesn't fix all our problems. And that's when, I guess, like, talking to my father-in-law kind of helped, where it's like, well, actually, economic problems are generally, like, we generally consider them to be, like, allocation of limited resources, which is normally money, particularly in, like, capitalist economies, etc. But arguably, the open source economic problem is allocation of, like, limited maintainers or, like, people, right? If you, you want to have stuff done, there are a relatively small number of people who can do those things, and you don't necessarily have enough resources to get those people to do those things. And... If you have more money, does that somehow automatically add more of that? Well, I guess not really, because for some people, they have a full-time job, and the amount of money they would need to have to quit their full-time job and then do the open source thing full-time is a lot more than your project can have or guarantee or whatever. So it's tricky. But then for me, I think, like, again, it feels like a weird thing to kind of frame in terms of economics, but I think the best economic thing you can do for your project to kind of maintain the amount of maintainer time you have and increase it is to make it actually an enjoyable place. If open source is a place where people want to go, if we come to events like this, we see each other, we make friends, we make friends on our project, then we want to work more with those people, we want to help those people out, and we're having a good time. If open source is like a horrible drudgery place where people on the internet just shout at you all day, which it also can be, um, then you're probably going to want to spend less of your time doing that 
Um, and if you're like me, then uh, you will probably be shocked when on a Saturday night you're spending like, your time smashing out some code from the open source project, look completely miserable, and your wife's like, why, why do you two do this again? Like, are you sure you want to do this? So yeah, so try and enjoy it. Try and make it an enjoyable space for other people. Again, final note, like I've seen kind of concerning stuff around AI where I guess including some of the existing talk where there's a, a worry right now that we're moving to a world where um, everything is kind of open source underneath the hood, but then everything is very proprietary in the front and we maybe have open source data models or whatever, but you don't have any of the training data and is this going to mean sort of the death of open source? But to me, the only thing I've seen that looks close to failing in the last few years is open source is like a business model where there's a bunch of projects who have, I'm not going to name any names, but you know who they are, uh, who had this sort of approach. Either they fell into this trap or this was forced upon them by their maintainers or investors or whatever. But I would argue, and this is the model I'm trying to take, and we'll see whether it works or not, is that like, this is a better model for open source business, which is instead of trying to have like the open source side and the financial side in direct competition with each other, you have something where the business side and the open source side kind of contribute nicely to the same kind of ecosystem. I remember I had a job, um, and I will name them because they were a lovely bunch of people, at a company called KDAB a few years ago. It's my first job kind of working primarily on open source stuff. Um, I was very excited that I was like, great, I work on KDE, now I work at this company who hires lots of KDE maintainers, and I can get paid to work on KDE stuff. But I found quite quickly that the problems that uh, often open source consultancy companies are paid to work on are actually, in fact, not the most interesting problems, but the most boring problems, because people who will do them for fun don't want to solve those problems, so you have to pay people to do them. And to me, like, this is the... the I mean, it's not a very inspiring pitch to kind of come and work with me, I guess, at the company, but... Um, <laughs> But I do think there's a class of problems where you can't expect volunteers to solve them and you do want big companies to be involved with them. Um, the big companies, sorry, expect this stuff to be solved, but the volunteers don't want to do it. And that's where, to me, it feels like a good kind of fit. And if you're interested in what I'm doing with this stuff, then we've got a little website at workbrew.com and a demo and all this type of stuff. So, in short, quick summary. Uh, boundaries. Remember, open source maintainers and volunteers owe you nothing. Remember, you can say no to things. And you don't need to mentor first-time contributors. For burnout, consider finding a therapist if you don't have one already. Or changing one if you hate your current one, which is also a thing, it seems. Um, consider the kind of mentorship diamond of mentoring above, below, side by side. And that if you can get more users and make it easier to become contributors, make it easier to become maintainers, then that might make your life easier. And I talked a bit about making homebrew financials sustainable and how that's about often making maintainers happy and avoiding them burning out as much as it is about money and what I thought about open source business. So feel free to answer any questions now, but if you don't want to ask in front of the room, then here are my contact deeds and stuff like that. And thank you very much for having me. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm over here. Um, I really liked your analogy with the API uh, in terms of humans and machines. Uh, and I'm curious if you, like good APIs are well publicly documented, I guess. And so I wonder if you have taken that analogy to that point of like having sort of a document. I've, I used to have a colleague who would have like a Google Doc that would be like, how to work with me. Uh, yeah, I actually do. I, I was polishing it. Like hopefully my uh, company will have our first employee in the kind of coming month. So I've been taking my old one from GitHub and then repolishing it for the current day. Yeah, for anyone who hasn't done this before, it's a really nice resource in uh, companies, and I guess it could work in open source as well. It's the way I saw it framed as like a human user guide, where it's like things you might not know about me, things that I really like, uh, things that when my coworkers do this, it makes me happy, things when my coworkers do this, it makes me sad, like those types of things. Um, yeah, so I agree with you. Like I think, yeah, trying to publicly document that, or at least internally document that. Like, there's enough in my one that I wouldn't probably want to put on the public internet just yet. But yeah, I mean, you've inspired me. I might even make a, a, a public version of this so we a, can... A follow-up question to that. So if you write such a document, how do you find the boundary between like, kind of being honest and setting, actually setting the boundaries and not coming across as rude, as in, the, in setting those boundaries? 
Uh, well, so the best way I found to avoid coming across as rude when I worked with Californians is, uh, <laughs> who, who had not worked with Scottish people before, is just to say, oh, all oh, Scottish people are like this. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, as pretty much all of my friends and family and coworkers of all time would tell you, I am not the person to ask uh, on how to avoid coming across as rude. Um, <laughs> But I guess I would say, like, as a middle ground, I guess, maybe not quite rudeness, but something I've been uh, dealing with, like, at work, with, like, a small startup with, kind of, you know, impassioned people, is you quite often end up in situations where someone maybe needs to hear something, and you know it's going to hurt their feelings. And to me, like, the two failure states for that are either you don't tell them what they need to hear because you're worried it's going to hurt their feelings. Or you say, well, it's going to hurt their feelings anyway, so YOLO, like... <laughs> uh, and yeah, and I, I guess my take is, as long as you're willing to kind of try your hardest to be as nice as you can and hurt their feelings as little as you can and be willing to admit you're wrong and apologize and these types of things, then you can get away with being rude, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah, don't have the answer to that one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, over here, hey. Thank you so much for your talk. I'm Canadian, so I fall somewhere between American and European philosophies. Um, I think you alluded to this, but the biggest economic problem for open source projects is actually the free rider problem, where so many people can use uh, software that they don't end up contributing to or paying for. And I'm wondering if you have any examples of open source projects that have achieved kind of a hybrid model of being able to keep things open source and free for people who can't pay, but for those who can, and we know there are so many large companies that do have incredible ability to pay for stuff that don't, how do we incentivize them? Yeah, that's a great question, thank you. Um, so. On the free rider problem, I have maybe a slightly contentious take, um, which is that I think if you completely eliminated the free rider problem, you kill open source. Mm -hmm. Because open source is, I mean, I guess we've seen this in the last few years with the kind of the varying uh, licenses. And I'm maybe a bit more of a purist in terms of I think if you say, well, um, Mike can use this because he doesn't have lots of money, but Amazon can't because they've got lots of money, you, you kind of kill what makes open source what it is. So for me, it's about kind of thinking about creative ways of, of solving that. So some of it, I think, is like you're going to have a certain amount of free riders, and you're going to have... And also, I think what makes open source interesting is, you know, and I, I include my own projects and work in this as well, is that I think if we end up with a culture where everyone is expected to pay their way to kind of be involved with open source, I'm not saying that you're saying this, but I have seen some people who have, then we... Why would a company almost like want to use open source, right? They can just build everything internally as they were doing 20, 25 years ago. So I, I don't see like a, an easy solution to that. I wish I did, um, but I guess the solution, as I said, I'm, I'm trying to do right now is the idea of you maybe just don't provide support for free for the things that are massively important to big companies. Like, um, I don't know how many of you have the misfortune of reading Hacker News comments on occasion, but ev every so often there's like a manifesto there of like, it's very important that we as an industry start doing this thing. And I really like those because 50% of them convinced me to do the exact opposite of what the person is trying to convince me to do. And there was this website called SSO.tax that essentially talked about how, um, look at all these companies who are outrageously gouging people who want to use like single sign-on and stuff like that. Um, and I saw that and I thought, that's a really good idea because that's a way to essentially be like, well, if you're a big organization who has the requirement for this for some ISO certification or like, whatever it may be, then you say, well, we're going to charge you a lot more. And if you're like an individual user, we're going to charge you a lot less or, or nothing. And I wonder if it, that could work with some open source models as well, that if you have features in your project that you know are only going to be used by the biggest of the biggest corporations, then you say, well, that stuff you have to pay us for, or it's under a license we know you don't want to use, but you can pay us to have it under a more liberal license, or I don't know. Lots of ideas, no solutions. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, we're at time. Thanks, folks. Thanks, Mike. And if you have